A system consists of a finite number of resources to be disturbed among a number of competing res processes. The resources are partitioned into several types, each consisting of some numbers of identical instances. Memory space, CPU cycle, files and input devices such, such as printers and DVD types are examples of resource types. If a system of has two CPUs, then the resource type CPU has two instances. Similarly, the resource type printer may have five instances. If a process requests an instance of a resource type, the allocation of any instance of a type will satisfy the request. If it will not, then the instance for an identical and the resource type class have not been defined properly. For example, a system may have two printers. These two printers may be defined or to be in the same resource class if no one cares which printer prints which output. However, if one printer is in the right ninth floor and another printer is in the basement, then the people of the ninth floor may not see both printers as equivalent and separate resource classes may need to be defined for each printer. Under the normal mode of operation, a process may utilize a resource in only few sequences. First one, request. If a request cannot be granted immediately, then the requesting process must wait until it can acquire the resources. Second, use. The process can operate on the resource. Third one, release. The process release the resources. The request are release of resources are system calls as explained in the chapter 2 which we have studied earlier explain examples are the request release and some other examples are given for each use of kernel kernel manage resource by a process or thread the operating system checks to make sure that the processes has requested and has been allocated the resources a system table records whether each resource is free or allocated. For each resources that is allocated, the table also records the process to which it is allocated. If a process requests a resource that is cur currently allocated to another process, it can be added to a queue of processes waiting for this resource. To illustrate a deadlock state, uh, consider a system with three CD RW drives. Suppose each of three process holds of one of these CD drives. If each process now requests another drive, the three processes will be in deadlock state. Each is waiting for another, each is waiting for the CD RW is released, which can be caused only by one of the other waiting processes. This example illustrates a deadlock involving the same resource type. A program who is developing multi-threaded application must pay particular attention to this problem. Multi-threaded program are good candi candidates for deadlock because multiple threads can compete for shared resources. Thank you. Deadlock characterization. In a deadlock, processes never finish executing and system resources are tied up preventing other jobs from starting before we discuss the various methods for dealing with the deadlock problem we'll look more closely at features that characterize deadlocks necessary conditions a deadlock situation can arise if the following four conditions hold simultaneously only in the system mutual exclusion at least one resource must be held in a non harassable mode that is only one process at the time can use the resource. If another process requests the resource, the requesting process must be delayed until the resource has been released. Deadlock with mutex locks. Let's see how deadlock can occur in a multi-thread p-thread program using mutex locks. The p-thread mutex unit function initializes an unlock mutex Mutex locks are acquired and released using pthread mutex locks and pthread mutex unlock respectively. If a thread attempts to acquire a lock mutex to call to x pthread mutex lock blocks the thread until the owner of the mutex lock invokes 
P thread mutex unlock two mutex locks are created in the following code example. As you can see the example here. Next two threads, thread one and thread two, are created, and both these threads have access to mutex locks thread one and thread two. Run in the functions do work one and do work two respectively, as shown in the figure seven point one. In this example, thread one attempts to acquire the mutex locks in the order one. First mutex. Second mutex while thread 2 attempts to acquire the mutex locks in the order 1 second mutex 2 first mutex deadlock is possible if thread 1 acquires first mutex while thread 2 acquires second mutex note that even though deadlock is possible it will occur if thread 1 is able to acquire and release the mutex locks for first mutex and second mutex. Before two attempts to acquire the locks, this example illustrates a problem with handling deadlocks. It is difficult to identify and test for deadlocks may occur only in certain circumstances. Second one, hold and wait. A process must be holding at least one resource and waiting to acquire additional resources that are currently being held by other processes. No preemption. Resources can cannot be preempted. That is, a resource can be released only voluntarily by the process holding it after that process has completed its task. Fourth one. Circular weight. A set of P0 to Pn of waiting process must be exit such that P0 is waiting for a resource held by P1. P1 is waiting for a resource held by P2 to Pn-1 is waiting for a resource held by Pn and P1 is waiting for a resource held by Pn. V emphasize that all four conditions must hold for a deadlock to occur. The circular weight condition implies the hold and weight condition. So the four conditions are not completely independent. We shall see in section 7.4 however that is useful to consider each condition separately. Resource allocation graph Deadlocks can be described more precisely in terms of directed graph called a system resource allocation graph. This graph consists of a set of vertices V and a set of edges E. The set of vertices V is into two different types of nodes P, P1 to Pn, the set consisting of all the active processes in the system and R equal to R1 to Rm, the set consisting of all resources types in the system. A direct, directed edge from processes Pn to resource type Rj is denoted by Pi Rj. It signifies that process Pn has requested an instance of resource type Ri and is currently waiting for the resource. A directed edge from resource type Rj to process Pi is denoted by Rj to P. It signifies that the instance of resource type Rj has been allocated to process Pi. A directed edge P1 to Rj is called a request edge. A directed edge Ri to Pi is called an assessment edge. Pictorially, we represent each process Pi as a circle and each resource type Ri has a rectangle. Since resource type Ri may have more than one instance, we represent each such instance as a dot within the rectangle. Note that request edge points to only the rectangle Rj whereas an assessment edge must also designate one of the dots in the rectangle. When process PI requests an instance of resource type Rj, a request edge is inserted in the resource allocation graph. When this request can be fulfilled, the request edge is instantaneously transformed to an assessment edge when the process no longer needs access to the resource. 
it releases the resource as a result the assignment edge is deleted the resource allocation graph shown in figure 7.2 depicts the following situation the set p comma r and as follows the p set the r set and the gamma set resource instances one instance of resource type r1 r2 r3 and three instance resource of resource type r1 next you can see figure 7.2 resource allocation graph process stats process p1 is holding an instance of resource type r2 and is waiting for an instance of resource type r1 process p2 is holding an instance of r1 and instance of r2 and is waiting for an instance of r3 process p3 is holding an instance of r3 given the definition of resource allocation graph it can be shown that if the graph contains no cycles then no processes in the system is deadlocked if the graph does contain a cycle then a deadlock may exist if each resource type has exactly one instance then a cycle implies that a deadlock has occurred if the cycle involves only a set of resource types each of which has only a single instance then a deadlock has occurred each process involved in the cycle is deadlocked in the in this case a cycle in the graph is both a necessary and a sufficient condition for the existence of deadlock if each resource type has several instances then a cycle does not necessarily imply that a deadlock has occurred in this case a cycle in the graph is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the existence of deadlock to illust illustrate this concept we return to the resource allocation graph depicted in figure 7.2 suppose that process p3 requests an instance of resource type r2 since no resource instance is currently available a request edge p3 to r2 is added to the graph as shown in figure 7.3 at this point two minimal cycles exist in the system as shown p1 to p n p2 to p2 processes p1 p2 and p3 are deadlocked processes p2 is waiting for the resource r3 which is held by process p3 process p3 is waiting for the either process p1 as shown in the figure 7.2 resource allocation graph with a deadlock or process p2 to re release resource r2 in additional process p1 is waiting for process p2 to re release resource r1 now consider the re resource allocation graph in figure 7.4 in this example we also have a cycle p1 to p1 however there is no deadlock observe that process p4 may release its instance of resource type r2 that resource can then be allocated to p3 breaking the cycle in summary if a resource allocation graph does not have a cycle then the system is not in a deadlock state if there is a cycle then the system may or may not be in a deadlocked state this observation is important when we deal with the deadlock problem figure 7.4 resource allocation graph with the cycle but no deadlock methods for handling deadlocks generally speaking we can deal with the deadlock problem in one of three ways first one we can use a protocol to prevent or avoid deadlocks ensuring that the system will never enter a deadlock state second one we can allow the system to enter a deadlock state detect it and recover third one we can ignore the problem altogether and pretend that deadlocks never occur in the system the third solution is the one used by the most operating systems including unix and windows it is then up to application developer to write programs that handle deadlocks next we elaborate 
briefly on each of the three methods for handling deadlocks. De then in section 7.4 through 7.7, .7, we present detailed algorithms. However, before proceeding, we should mention that some researchers have argued that none of the basic approaches alone is appropriate for the entire spectrum of resource allocation problems in operating system. The basic approaches can be combined, however, allowing us to select an optimal approach for each class of resources in system. To ensure that deadlocks never occur, the system can use either a deadlock prevention or deadlock avoidance scheme. Deadlock prevention provides a set of methods for ensuring that at least one of the necessary condition cannot hold. These methods prevent deadlocks by constraining how requests for resources can be made. We discuss these methods in se section 7.4. Deadlock avoidance requires that the operating system be given in advance additional information concerning which resources a process will request and use during its lifetime. With this additional knowledge, it can decide for each request whether or not the process should wait to decide whether the current request can be satisfied or must be delayed. The system must consider the resources currently available. The resources currently allocated to each process and the future request and release of each process we discuss these schemes in section 7.5. If a system does not employ either a deadlock prevention or a deadlock avoidance algorithm, then a deadlock situation may arise. In this environment, the system can provide an algorithm that examines the state of system to determine whether a deadlock has occurred and algorithm to recover from the deadlock. We discuss these issues in section 7.6 and 7.7. .7. If a system neither ensures that a deadlock will never occur nor provides a mechanism for deadlock detection and recovery, then we may arrive at a situation where the system is in a deadlocked state yet has no way of recognizing what, ha what has happened. In this case, the undetected deadlock will result in deterioration of the system's performance. Because resources are being held by processes that cannot run and because more and more processes as they make requests for resources will enter a deadlock state. Eventually, the system will stop functioning and will need to be restarted manually. Although this method may not seem to be a viable approach to the deadlock problem, it is nevertheless used in most operating systems. As mentioned earlier, in many systems, deadlocks occur frequently, say once per a year. Thus, this method is cheaper than the prevention, avoidance or detection and recovery methods, which must be used constantly. Also, in some circumstances, a system is in a frozen state but not in a deadlocked state. We see this situation, for example, with a real-time process running at the highest priority or any process running on a non-preemptive scheduler and never returning control to the operating system. The system must have manually recovery methods for such conditions and may simply use those techniques for deadlock recovery. 7.4 Deadlock Prevention Mutual exclusion. The mutual exclusion condition must hold for non-shareable resources. For example, a printer cannot be simultaneously shared by several process shareable resources, in contrast, do not require mutually exclusive access and thus cannot be involved in a deadlock. Read only files at the same time, they can be granted. Simultaneously access to the file. A process never needs to wait for shareable resources. In general, however, we cannot prevent deadlock by denying the mutual exclusion condition because some resources are intrinsically non-shareable. 7.4.2 Hold and wait To ensure that the hold and wait condition never occur in the system we must guarantee that whenever a process requests a resource, it does not hold any other resources. 
One protocol that can be used requires each process to request and be allocated all its resources before it begins execution. We can implement this provision by requiring that system calls requesting resources for a process precede all the other system's calls. An alternative protocol allows a process to request resources only when it has none. A process may request some resources and use them before it can request any additional resources. To illustrate the difference between these two protocols, we consider a process that copies data from DVD drive to a file one disk, sort the files, and then print the result to a printer. If all resources, however, it must release all the resources that it is currently allocated. In the previous topic, you learned how to prevent deadlock by ensuring that at least one of the necessary conditions for deadlock cannot occur. And you also learned about possible side effects of preventing deadlocks. Now, in this topic, let us learn about deadlock avoidance. There are three methods to avoid the deadlock. First one is safe state. A state is safe if the system can allocate resources to each process in some order and still avoid a deadlock. Let us understand this with an example. Consider there are three processes P0, P1 and P2 and the maximum needs of these processes are 10, 4, 9 respectively. But there are only 12 magnetic tape drivers are available. So first let us allocate 5 drives to P0, 2 drives to P1 and 2 drives to P2. Now we are left with 3 tape drives. You can see that by allocating 2 more drives to P1, we can fulfill all the resources needed by the P1 process. Remember that when a process gets all the resources it needed, it will be get executed. So now the P1 process will get executed and the all 4 process which are used to execute P1 will be released. The released resources can be used to execute other 2 processes. So, by allocating 5 more resources to the P0 process, we can execute the P0 and 10 resources will be get freed and can be used to execute the P2 process. This is called safe section. Let us look at the unsafe section. Instead of allocating 2 more tab drives to P1, if we allocate 3 drives to P2, the process will be get stacked. Not, sing not a single process will be get executed. This is called deadlock. So in the unsafe section, there is a possibility of deadlock. The second method to avoid the deadlock is resource allocation graph. In this method, resources and processes are represented as vertices and the request and allocation are represented as edges. As you can see in the image, R1 and R2 are the resources and P1 and P2 are processes. Process P1 and P2 are requesting for R2 and the resource R1 is allocated to P1. This is an example for unsafe state in resource allocation graph. As you can see, R2 resource is allocated to process P2. But process P2 is requesting for R1, which is already allocated to P1. And P1 process is requesting for R2. This is a deadlock situation. The third method to avoid the deadlock is banker's algorithm. This is less efficient than resource allocation graph but it is applicable to a resource allocation system with multiple instances of each resource type. The banker's algorithm name was chosen because the algorithm could be used in a banking system to ensure that the bank never allocated its available cash in a such a way that it could no longer satisfy the needs of all its customers. In a deadlock detection concept, we will try to understand what is a deadlock detection, a single instance of each resource type, a several instance of resource type, and lastly, detection usage algorithm. So let us try to understand what is a deadlock detection. Without a prevention or awareness mechanism, a deadlock situation may occur in the system. Deadlock refers to a state where multiple processes are unable to proceed because they are each waiting for a resource that is held by another process. The system needs to be implement a deadlock detection algorithm to periodically examine the state of the system and determine whether a deadlock has occurred. There are various deadlock detection algorithms like the resource allocation graph, banker's algorithm, etc. Once a deadlock is detected, the system must initiate a deadlock recovery algorithm to resolve the deadlock and allow the process to progress. 
Deadlock recovery involves breaking the circular weight condition by preempting resources from one or more process or rolling back some process to safe state. So, implementing a detection and recovery scheme introduces overhead to the system. This overhead includes the runtime cost of maintaining the necessary information for a deadlock detection and executing the deadlock algorithm at a regular interval. So, deadlock recovery may involve rolling back process or preempting resources, which can lead to a loss of progress and wasted computational effort. The recovery process might result in discarding the work done by some process before the deadlock occurred. In a system with only a single instance of each resource type, deadlock recovery becomes more challenging as there are limited options for a resource reallocation or a preemption. Systems with several instances of each resource type have more flexible in a deadlock recovery as resource can be reallocated or preempted from one process to another more easily. Detection and recovery are reactive measures to handle deadlocks after they occur. To minimize the occurrence of a deadlocks and reduce the need for a recovery overhead, prevention or awareness technique should be considered during system design and resource allocation. Let's move to the next concept, single instance of each resource type. In a system with only a single instance of each resource type, a weight for a graph is used for a deadlock detection. It is derived from the resource allocation graph by removing the resource nodes and collapsing the appropriate edges. An edge from a process PI to PJ in a weight for a graph implies that process PI is waiting for a process PJ to release a resource that PI needs. An edge PI should be greater than PJ exists in the weight for graph if and only if the cross corresponding resource allocation graph contains two edges. PI should be R greater than RK and RK should be greater than PJ for some resources RQ. So deadlock condition exists in the system if and only if the weight for the graph contains a cycle. A cycle in the weight for graph indicates that a set of processes is waiting for each other resources creating a circular weight scenario. To detect deadlock, the system needs to maintain the weight for graph and periodically walks an algorithm that search for a cycle in the graph. There are various algorithms for a cycle detection such as depth first search or a breadth first search. The algorithm to detect a cycle in the graph requires an order of n square operation where n is the number of vertices in the weight for a graph. The cycle detection process involves traversing the graph and performing graph operation. The deadlock detection algorithm should be evoked at a regular interval to ensure timely detection of deadlocks. The frequency of evasion depends on the system requirement and likelihood of deadlock accuracy. Deadlock detection is a reactive approach since it identifies deadlocks after they have already acquired. The system must be prepared to handle detected deadlocks through recovery mechanism. While deadlock detection allows system to recover from a deadlocks, it inquires overhead due to a periodic execution of the algorithm and maintenance of the weight for graph. Prevention and avoidance techniques should be still be considered to minimize deadlock occurrence and reduce recovery overhead. Let's move to the next concept, several instances of a resource type. The deadlock detection algorithm employs several time varying data structures that are similar to those used in a banker's algorithm. And a vector of length m indicates the number of available resources of each type. And a n into m matrix defining the number of resources of each type currently allocated to each process. And a n into m matrix indicates the current request for each process. If a request i into j equals to k, then process p i is requesting k more instant of resource type rj. A vector of length n indicates the completion status for each reprocesses. It is used to track processes that have been fully allocated resources. Compare this algorithm with the banker's algorithm of section 7.5.3 has. Initialize the work as available and set all processes finished to false, except for the process with allocation i equal to 0, which are set to true. Find an index i such that both conditions are true. Finish i is equal to false. The process is not yet completed. Request i should be less than or equal to 1. The process resources request can be satisfied with available resources. If such an index i is found, add the resource allocated to process pi back to the available resources. Mark pi as a completed and repeat step 2. If number process satisfy the condition in step 2 and there is a process fi with the finish i is equal to false, then the system is in deadlock state. Moreover, 
process pi is a deadlocked so the algorithm requires an order of n into n square operation to detect whether the system is deadlocked state where n is the number of processes so when a process pi satisfy the condition in step 2 and its resources are released the algorithm assumes that pi will be required no more resources to complete its task this obstacle assumption held avoid immediate deadlock detection the algorithm can be demonstrated through an example system with a multiple process and resource type by following the algorithm step and updating the data structure according the system deadlock state can be determined the deadlock detection algorithm is di- different from the baker's algorithm in that it solely focuses on identifying deadlocked process based on resources allocation and request matrices the baker's algorithm also ensures safe state and resource allocation based on resource need and resource availability in summary the deadlock detection algorithm for a system with multiple in front of each resource type involves maintaining time varying data structure to track resource allocation request and the process completion the algorithm searches for a deadlock condition by examining the availability of resources and the process situation and it can be used to periodically check for potential deadlocks in the system as we can see in a figure to illustrate this algorithm we consider a system with a five process p0 through p4 and three resources type a b and c resource type a has a seven instant resource type b has a two instant and resource type c has a six instant suppose that at time t0 we have of the following resource allocation state as we can see in a figure we claim that the system is not dead deadlocked state indeed if we execute our algorithm we will find that the sequence pn P two, P three, P one, P four result in a finish i is equal to is equal to two. For all i, suppose now that process P two makes one additional request for an instant of type C. The request matrix is modified as follow, as we can see in a figure. We claim that the system is now deallocated. Although we can reclaim the resources held by process P not, the number of available resources is not sufficient to fulfill the request of other processes. Thus, a deadlock exists consists of process P1, P2, P3, and P4. Let's move to the next concept: detection algorithm usage. The decision to evoke the deadlock detection algorithm de- depends on how frequently deadlocks are likely to occur in the system. If deadlocks are frequent, the algorithm should be invoked more frequently to detect and resolve deadlock promptly. The number of processes affected by a deadlock when it occurs is also a crucial factor. If a deadlock involves a significant number of processes, it can several impact system performance and resource utilization. Deadlocks occur when a process makes a request that cannot be immediately granted. In the extreme case, the detection algorithm can be evoked every time a request for a resource allocation cannot be satisfied immediately this approach helps identify the specific process that caused the deadlock allowing for a targeted deadlock resolution by evoking the deadlock detection algorithm for each resource request it become possible to not only detect the deadlocked set of processes but also pinpoint the specific process that lead to a deadlock The identifiable process is the one who requests completed a chain of waiting processes. Evoking the deadlock detection algorithm for a every resource request in requires considerable computation overhead. Therefore, it may not be practically in all scenarios, especially in system with high resource contention and frequent request. A less expensive alternative is to evoke the deadlock detection algorithm. at less frequent intervals such as once per hour or when system resource utilization drops below a certain threshold frequency this approach balances the need for a deadlock detection with the computation of overhead so deadlock eventually lead to a decrease in the system throughout causing a cpu utilization to drop monitor ending cpu utilization and evoking the detection algorithm when it drops below a certain level can help identify potential deadlock situation if the detection algorithm is evoked at arbitrary points in time and there are multiple deadlocks it may be challenging to determine which specific process caused the deadlock or in the many deadlock process the frequency of evoking the deadlock detection algorithm should be determined based on the likelihood of deadlocks occurring and the several of their impact on the system frequent evacuation helps identifying specific deadlocks caused but what 
comes with computational overhead so a balance should be stuck to maintain system efficiency while ensuring a timely detection and resolution of a deadlock so this is all about a deadlock detection recovery from deadlock when a detection algorithm determines that a deadlock exists several alternatives are available one possibility is to inform the operator that a deadlock has occurred and to let the operator deal with the deadlock manually another possibility is to let the system recover from the deadlock automatically there are two options for breaking a deadlock one is simply to abort one or more processes to break the circular wait the other is to preempt some resources for one or more of the deadlocked processes process termination to eliminate deadlocks by aborting a process we use one of two methods in both methods the system reclaims all resources allocated to the terminated processes first abort all the deadlocked processes this method third clearly will break the deadlock cycle but at a great expense the deadlocked process may have computed for a long time and the result of this partial computation must be discarded and probably will have to be computed later second about one process at a time until the deadlock cycle eliminated this method in occur considerable overhead since after each process is aborted a deadlock detection algorithm must be invoked to determine whether any process are still deadlocked aborting a process may not be easy if the process was in the midst of updating a file terminating it will leave the file in an incorrect state Similarly if the process was in the midst of printing data on a printer the system must reset the printer to a correct state before printing the next job if the partial termination method is used then we must determine which deadlock process or processes should be terminated this determination is policy decision similar to cpu scheduling decision the question is basically an economic one we should abort those processes whose termination will in occur the minimum cost unfortunately the term minimum cost is not a precise one many factors may affect which process is chosen including first what the priority of a process is second how long the process has computed and how much longer the process will compute before completing its designated task third how many and what type of resources the process has used for example whether the resources are simple to preempt fourth how many more resources the process needs in order to complete fifth how many processes will need to be terminated sixth whether the process is interactive or a batch resource preemption to eliminate deadlocks using resource preemption we successively preempt some resources for from processes and give these resources to other processes until the deadlock cycle is broken if a preemption is required to deal with deadlocks then three issues needed to address it first selecting a victim which resource and which process has to be preempted as in process termination we must determine the order of preemption to minimize cost cost factor may include such a parameters as the number of resources a deadlocked process is holding and the amount of time the process has thus far consumed during its execution second rollback if we preempt a resource from a process what should be done with that process clearly it cannot continue with its normal execution it is missing some needed resource we must roll back the process to some safe state and restart it from the state since in general it is difficult to determine what a safe state is the simplest solution is a total rollback abort the process and then restart it 
although it is more effective to roll back the process only as far as necessary to break the deadlock this method requires the system to keep more information about the state of all running processes third starvation how do we ensure that starvation will not occur that it is how can we guarantee that resources will not always be preempted from the same process in a system where victim select is based primarily on cost factors it may happen that the same process is always picked as a victim as a result this process never complete its designated task a star starvation situation that must be dealt with in an practical system clearly we must ensure that a process can be picked as a victim only finite numbers of times the most common solution is to include the number of rollbacks in the cost factor now let's look at the summary a deadlock state occurs when two or more processes are waiting indefinitely for an event that can be caused only by one of the waiting processes there are three principal methods for dealing with deadlocks first is use some protocol to prevent or avoid deadlocks ensuring that the system will never enter a deadlock state and second is allow the system to enter a deadlock state detect it and then recover and third is to ignore the problem altogether and pretend that deadlocks never occur in the system the third solution is the one used by most operating systems including unix and windows a deadlock can occur only if four necessary conditions hold simultaneously in the system first is mutual exclusion second is hold and wait third is no preemption and fourth is circular wait to prevent deadlocks we can ensure that at least one of the necessary conditions never holds a method for avoiding deadlocks that is less stringent than the prevention algorithms requires that the operating system have a priori information on how each process will utilize system resources the banker's algorithm for example requires a priori information about the maximum number of each resource class that may be requested by each process using this information we can define a deadlock avoidance algorithm If a system does not employ a protocol to ensure that deadlocks will never occur then a detection and recovery scheme must be employed a deadlock detection algorithm must be invoked to determine whether a deadlock has occurred if a deadlock is detected the system must recover either by terminating some of the deadlocked processes or by preempting resources from some of the deadlocked processes where preemption is used to deal with deadlocks three issues must be addressed first is selecting a victim second is roll back and third is starvation in a system that selects victims for roll back primarily on the basis of cost factors starvation may occur and the selected process can never complete its designated task finally researchers have argued that none of the basic approaches alone is appropriate for the entire spectrum of resource allocation problems in operating system the basic approaches can be combined however allowing us to select an optimal approach for each class of resources in a system